A very good afternoon, everybody who has joined us live on Facebook for this chat show with the counselors on digital responsibility, the do's and the don'ts. We are very fortunate to have with us uh, Miss Tiffany Ingram. Uh, she is a pastoral lead and head of languages at Wapping High School in East London. That's our international partner school. She also leads coaching throughout the school and believes in this approach for nurturing independent and prepared learners. She is passionate about student engagement and well-being and believes in a holistic approach to educating the whole. Welcome, Tiffany. Thank you. We also have with us our very own head counselor at Elpro International School, Ms. Kinjal Goradia. She's a professional counselor and is associated with EIS since eight years. With an affable personality, she has been a favorite among students of all ages. Welcome, Kinjal. Thank you, Sudanda. We also, the moderator for today's chat show is Aradita Saraf. She is the founder of Eloquent, a digital writing center. Additionally, as a digital hygiene trainer with Google News Initiative, she ensures all the content generated through her platform is fact-checked before it is published. She believes that in this exponentially growing world of technology, digital hygiene, hygiene is as important as physical cleanliness, safety, and security. Aradita is our content partner and has worked extensively with the school. It's my great honor to welcome all the three of you. Say hi, Aradita. Thank you. Thank you, Sudanda. All right. So without any further ado, Aradita, it's all up to you now to lead this chat show. So Thank you so much. Enjoy this. Thank, Thank you, Sudanda. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Saganda. Good afternoon to all of you and thank you so much for streaming our chat show today. I really hope you are, you've been keeping well and indoors. Over the last couple of months, uh, we've all been taking utmost care to wash our hands and maintain personal hygiene. And now I believe it is time to reciprocate that in our digital lives as well. So without wasting much time, um, let's learn about more. Let's learn more about how we can maintain digital hygiene by our guest speakers present here today. Um, while researching more on this topic, I learned that 59% of teenagers in the US have been bullied or harassed online. And that brings me to my first question to Tiffany. Um, what do you think are some ways in which we can safeguard ourselves from cyberbullying? Absolutely. Um, I think it's a, it's a really scary thing. And it is, you're right, quite prevalent across across the world. Um, I think the first step is really to, to help parents open those conversations with, um, with young people. Because if they're learning from home initially, it will make it easier for them to kind of work digitally in schools or with their friends, etc. Um, and tied in with that, I think it's really, really important that the school curriculum embeds the idea of digital hygiene and of kindness around digital hygiene um, to ensure our young people are making the right choices um, when they're logging on, particularly to their social media accounts. Um, and they're aware of, for instance, the safety features as well. For instance, on Instagram, if someone is being unkind to you, that you um, that you can report them. Likewise, on Snapchat, and you can disable things like location features. So it's really making sure that they're aware of what is available to them, what to do if someone is bullying them. Um, but then also, as I said at the beginning, those preventative measures that parents and schools can take to stop students thinking it's okay to bully each other online, because it can have lasting impacts, as, we, as we've seen, you know, many times on the mental health of students, as well as, you know, when they become adults, the mental health of adults, you see, you see people online being very unkind to each other all the time. Sure. Um, and I think if, you know, if that's stopped from a younger age, if those conversations are opened up, then we'll see less and less of that, hopefully. Um, so I think, you know, the message from schools and parents to their children has to be be kind to each other. And hopefully, you know, they'll take that on into their digital world. Yes. yes. That brings me to my next question to you, Kinjal. What do you think parents can do? How can they intervene and um, make sure kids are safeguarded from the perils of social media misuse? Uh, okay. So, uh, see, there are a few preventive measures which uh, we as parents uh, can take before the child enters the social media world. Uh, first being 
talking to your child what i see missing is talking and educating your child about what is social media what is instagram what are the features of instagram how what what all to do or in on instagram or facebook or on whatsapp anything any media what are we going to do about it so i think what is missing is parents talking to the children about it second is as a family a few rules need to be set it's very important for everybody in the family maybe a family of 3 or maybe a family of 10 you need to sit together and decide a few rules as you all mutually agree and need to follow it it's not only rules for children it's rules for adults also so that's the second thing third is how good a role model a parent is uh if the child sees the parent wisely using the digital device or the social media or anything on the device the child is likely to follow it likely but at the same time if the child sees that the parent is constantly on the phone uh playing games or uh, you know watching random things or just you know going on whatsapp and forwarding messages which don't need to be forwarded children are going to follow that also it's it's obviously said that children uh, you know do what they see and not what they hear so as parents you need to be a very good role model when you are going to implicate these uh, you know uh, the social media age uh, but one thing said it said so i what one thing i've seen is most of the parents also do, are not educated enough about the social media world uh, i'll i'll give you my example uh, just to i am from the facebook generation and not from the insta generation uh, so uh, a few i deal with the high school students so a few years back some students came and said ma'am you know this is what happened on insta and you know somebody said something and a few technical stuff uh, she said and i did not know anything about it i seriously did not know how to help this child so i realized that i need to also learn this you know this new thing instagram which has come into my life so i learned a few things only then i'll be able to help so similarly it goes to the parents also they need to learn one simple thing parents have to be one step ahead of the children and not behind so if parents know everything they'll be able to help so this is a few measures which parents uh, or adults can take around so that children do not fall into a trap yeah very very true that is very interesting and insightful um tiffany did you have any tips on uh, what what are some etiquettes parents can um, follow so that their children you know um children pra- practice what they preach so what are some um etiquettes you think parents should um teach their children through absolutely i think as kinja said that idea of modeling like use appropriate usage of your digital device um we're all on our phones and our computers and everything more than ever now especially because of the lockdown but for example a, a very easy win and i'm i'm completely guilty of this luckily i don't have any children who's who are going to see me but when when you go to bed instead of like passively scrolling through instagram or through the news or, or whatever it may be making sure um that you are modeling to your child that you know that you are turning that phone off or putting it even in another room to charge um and having that half hour to an hour before bedtime uh to make sure that your brain can start to relax that you're not getting that blue light in uh which is going to obviously disrupt your sleep um so i think that that's a really really important thing likewise just sort of you know basic manners um not having your phone out at dinner or lunch that kind of thing when you're with with your friends and you're kind of there to socialize not sort of having your phone in front of you and being you know un- essentially unsociable i think is is really really important um i also think in terms of modeling um making sure that you know parents are, are fact checking information before they they're forwarding it on not just sort of you know and sending out whatever they see without kind of thinking about it because that's that's how we see misinformation spreading and that that i think over the last maybe sort of 5 5 to 10 years has gotten really quite bad um and i think if children aren't taught to kind of consider what they're sharing and what they're putting out into the world if they see their parents just sort of randomly pushing everything forward then um they're going to struggle to make those right decisions so i'd say yeah probably a good sleep hygiene and digital hygiene combination making sure that um on a social scale your phone isn't kind of 
your top priority and and then making sure that you're you're being careful about what information you're putting out yes very very true i think um including just maintenance of digital hygiene these tips would also help us improve like relationships and our yes like personal okay. health just by getting better sleep eating more mindfully etc uh so social media when uh, overused is definitely uh, a big sign of it being misused so how how often do you think we should take breaks from our digital devices like how much time online is too much time online i'd uh, like to start with you kinjal now uh, i think the answer is in the question when you said how often i think often is the answer that we need to take a break from our digital devices uh, these days we've got a new concept of digital detoxification people uh, you know uh, rather than just the physical one uh, these days people leave their phones and you know for 15 days they don't want to be on insta or facebook or on whatsapp and then they come back because they want to see uh, how much it has affected them so often is the right word see what i understand over here is uh, on one side you have your work you have your personal life you have your family you have friends you have your hobbies and one side is the digital uh, life of yours mm-hmm. being these so many of these things but still we are giving a lot of time to the digital device so we are losing out on a lot of things over here so i think the balance has to be right over there only that where we understand these so many things need more of your time rather than this one digital device obviously during this pandemic we cannot compare anything because things are different presently but once we are back to the you know normal sea of life we need to understand and balance these two things when there are you know i just you just need to figure out you know virtually you can think about uh, you know these are you know such important things of your life and this is just one digital device what do you want to pay attention to so often is the right word i would think we should uh, you know give a break to our devices Absolutely and if I if I could add when um I've you know obviously been in contact with a lot of parents over the lockdown who've been concerned over you know are there are their children studying enough and obviously uh, most of the work is done digitally and I've made a made a point of saying you know build a revision timetable with your child but make sure that breaks are built in often yes. because you're in front of that screen for 6 hours a day it's yes. not healthy it doesn't matter if you're working for 6 hours a day it's not healthy for you to be that kind of engaged in a screen for that amount of time so i completely agree with you on that point kinjal i yes. agree as well i agree as well um So I think like when we are kids we don't even know what the importance of breaks are and how often to take them yes. which makes me think of what would be the best age to like give a child their own digital device maybe an iPhone or an iPad or even a laptop what like so that we know that the child is able to you know um, make these decisions of taking breaks and maintaining digital hygiene appropriately what do you believe would be a good age um tiffany could be here at thoughts on this yeah absolutely i mean it's it's a tricky one for me because as i as i said what with prime with uh, sorry secondary school children and i don't have any children of my own so i can understand how you know it might be an easy solution to hand a, a small child a device to to distract them however i do think it's important that they're sort of of the age where they understand you know the power of the device and and the safety features of the device as i mentioned before so i i mean i'd say probably to have their own personal device probably towards the end of primary beginning of secondary i mean you have you know i mean i i remember getting my first phone and it was very exciting but the only reason i was allowed a phone was because i had to go to school about an hour away from home and my mum wanted me to phone her uh to make yes. sure that i'd got there safely um so i think there are different reasons why parents might choose to give their child a device but then in which case i think it's very important that the parents are educated on the safeguarding kind of procedures they can use on the device so in terms of what they can restrict internet wise what apps they can restrict but also um what apps are a really positive addition for their children so learning apps or um i don't know if it's slightly older children like yoga or meditation like stuff that is going to help the children kind of thrive digitally um but also just being really mindful of what definitely will not 
Yes. Absolutely. Agree I would you. like to add up over yeah. here. Uh, I would agree with Tiffany as she said her own experience of her parents giving her the phone was for the safety. So I think when parents decide to give a device to the their children, they need to understand the purpose behind giving the device. Uh, if it's safety, as Tiffany said, or if it's work related. So if there's some research the child needs to do constantly, or you know, look at some YouTube videos for his education path. Then the answer is yes. But if the reason is if the child is throwing a tantrum that uh, I need a device because whole of my class has it, or I need a device because my friends are on Insta or Facebook, or I need a device because that's the cool thing these days, then the answer is no. And parents will have to really step in. It, it, it is very difficult. I'm a parent. I know that uh, your child can literally be behind your life to get her phone, but you have to be very clear in your head what is the purpose of giving the phone? Do not compare that this is a zamana hai, you know, in sorry, Tiffany, I'm a little, you know, one sentence of Hindi that, you know, these, uh, it's more like aajkal to sabke paas hai. everybody has it these days, you know, sab bacho ke paas hai. all children have it. Uh, if you're going to go by this thing, then I think we're on the wrong track of parenting. So as parents, we have to be a little more firm on that aspect. Yeah. Uh, it's very important to that. Yeah, Absolutely. I remember since I'm, yeah, sorry, Tiffany. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I was just going to say, you know, it's it's also important that parents teach their, their child how to, you know, manage the device in terms of, of the device hygiene as well. Because yes. I can't tell you the amount of students we have that can, you know, upload a crazy TikTok video or send out these like crazy Snapchats with loads of like graphics, but they cannot save a file with their yes. work on it somewhere sensible on a laptop um because they won't know how to name the file and then they won't be able to find it afterwards so it's also just you know sitting down with the child and making sure that, that they understand how the functionality of the of the either yes. the, the laptop or the phone um and make sure that you know they have a, a t i guess a tidy device in, in in that instance especially if they're at school um especially if they're of an age where they're starting to have more documents linked to their work um and you know they might have that it at school as well which can help with that but it is really useful if the parents can just kind of maintain that with them as well i think absolutely i think a good age then to summarize what both of you said would be when the child is able to completely yes. understand the uses of apps understand how to maintain the digital um, device and like tiffany mentioned understand the power of the digital yes. device um, since you mentioned like keeping your digital device tidy, I would like to ask you, Tiffany, um, how important is that considering that we are all now working out of our laptops? Um, it's basically become a workspace. We don't really need desks and diaries. A digital device or a laptop is basically what is helping us um, carry out all our um, work. So how important do you think it is to keep that tidy and what are some good ways to do that? Um, it's it's so, so important. I mean, I'm, I'm naturally very messy. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's so important for me to make sure that my files are accurately labeled, that they're, they're appropriately labeled so I can easily find stuff. I'm not like, oh, that could be in two different places um, <laughs> because it, it, that's not going to be time efficient for me as, as a teacher. Um, so I do think it is really, really important that, you know, whatever, whatever system you're working on, that you familiarize yourself with it, that you, you know, if you need to research it a little bit, that you do that and you create a space where you can have like a clear working area. Um, and also, you know, that you don't have a massively cluttered desktop, which I was for years, I was guilty of that until my partner just looked at me and went, what are you doing? And I was like, I should probably clear that up. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it, it's something that, you know, some some of us will naturally be able to do that and some of us will have to work on it. Um, but I do think making sure that, again, that is modelled to your students or to your children or whoever it is, um, it's incredibly important. I mean, as a, for instance, a GCSE student over here when you're sort of 15, 16, if you can't find your coursework on your computer, that's going to cause you extra stress. It's going to cause your teacher stress. It's going to cause your parents stress. So if you've kind of taken the time to make sure that your sort of digital cleanliness is, is up to date, 
Um, as well as on your phone, you know, that you kind of are going through, do you need those 700 apps? You probably don't need all 700 of them. Is your, are your devices going to be running slower because you haven't actually looked after them? Um, I think it's really, really important. And, you know, if I can do it, then I think anyone can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the inspiration, Tiffany. So I think we've um, ascertained by now that um, digital devices can be as much of a bane as a boon. Uh, it has as much of downsides as like um, their positives. Kinja, could you tell us a little more about what the biggest downside of social media sites is for you or um, if you've witnessed it for other people as well? Uh, in a one-liner, if I try to put this across, uh, your life is your life becomes a public land then so once you're on social media you have to be uh, you're there for people people know you and generally we all post the happy moments of our life when we are partying when we are going for a good trip or it's our anniversary or birthday but nobody posts anything when sad is happening something sad or something you know negative is happening in your life so uh, it's very important that once you're on social media and if you're posting very regularly, your life really becomes public and people are going to start judging you. So uh, it's you know it's simple as that. Your life doesn't remain yours. No. I think, you know, what Kinja said there is really important. And I think the idea of a digital footprint, the, the digital footprint that you leave online, yes. I don't think young people necessarily have a, Con context of, of how that can impact you later on so yes. if you're if you're posting things when you're 13 14 that's that will stay there they're like oh but I'll just delete it but someone will have screenshotted it or someone will have sent it to someone else and that can obviously have lasting ramifications I mean you hear you hear stories of it all the time with like you know politicians that put something online when they were in college and that then comes back to haunt them or they uploaded a photo that then comes back a few years later um and it can have really you know it can have impacts on careers yes. can have impacts on college places on on a whole range of things and I don't think that as I said I don't think young people are quite aware of how permanent essentially the internet is um, so I think it's it's really, really important that that is made super, super clear to them um, because that, that can have a lasting impact on them. Yes. Very, very, very true. Um, when we talk about communicating on social media and uh, just on the internet, I find there are two very different ways of communicating. Like there's the formal way of communicating with um, when you're working or um with your colleagues and then there's just the informal way of communicating on social media like um, through short forms, abbreviations, emojis and all of that. Uh, often because kids get access to their phones to um, and the first interaction is with their friends, they often tend to like uh, communicate informally first and then they cannot um, differentiate between formal communication and informal communication. Everything uh, on typed on the internet it becomes informal communication what do you think um, how can we instill this in kids like uh, teach them the difference between communications why is it important and do you think it's going to like affect communication in the long run um, I was hoping both of y'all could answer maybe Kinjal could answer this question first uh, okay so uh, you know in our real life how uh, we teach children about verbal, non-verbal communication. Similarly, I think we need to implement these new aspects of, uh, you know, digital communication also. Uh, because we start off with WhatsApp these days and where we write YOU uh, as you, you know. And sometimes we as adults also make a mistake while we are, you know, mailing something formally because we are so used to this, this kind of communication. So I think uh, teaching our children what is the difference between, you know, mailing or writing back something formally uh, or if you're with your friend and then how how is that, uh, you know, uh, okay. different uh, when you're dealing with uh, just friends. So this is very important that we need to teach our children. If you educate them that this is how it is, this is how the format is. In fact, I, rather in English, how we follow the letter writing and, uh, you know, formal and informal letter writing. I think these days we need to start off with digital letter writing or digital. This is going to come up, you know, late, later on in our life. Nobody's going to write letters. Who writes it now, though? 
but still when we write it digitally it's different so i think we need to implement this in our education system into our subjects and this is how we can implement it there yeah i i completely agree i mean i think as i mentioned before when we met i've i've had several students email me where the entire email is in the subject line so <laughs> i think um, i think teaching them you're quite right it's that old fashioned skill of letter writing but doing it on a computer so where things yes. go how simple things like how you like cc and bcc and all of yeah. that business, I think are really important but but having that language where they can communicate with adults or they can communicate with for instance if they're applying to a university or a college and the language is appropriate um, and I think that starts as well with you know how they speak to you face to face if a student says yo miss to me that that's it's not going to work out oh. um, and it's you know it's picking them up gently on that you know it's not telling them they're wrong but it's just showing them the differences between between the different uses of language and language I mean I'm a languages teacher so I find language super interesting whether that's different yeah. you know, modern languages or, or whether that's the way of communicating that young people and, and maybe older people have um but making sure that they understand the concept of just you know it doesn't even have to be really formal like dear sir but just writing an email that is appropriate to you know a respected adult i suppose um and you know otherwise they, they're really going to struggle when when they continue and it's the same i suppose in a text um you know, if my 14 year old niece texts me, I think she probably talks to me slightly differently to the way that she would her friend. Um, and I think it, it's, it is important that that is instilled. So perhaps when parents and, and children are texting that some of those boundaries are established. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so when kids are on social media, what do you think they should, uh, what, do, what do you think is the first thing they should be cautious about? Um, there are quite a few um, evils we should be um, wary of, but what do you think is the most important thing we should uh, be concerned about? Uh, okay, should I? Sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, I think if we divide this into three aspects, children are able to understand it better. One is they need to be cautious of what they see. Mm -hmm. Second is what they hear. Mm -hmm. And third is whom they meet. If these three aspects, they are able to, you know, like really divide and then, uh, you know, differentiate between these three, then they are able, uh, they are, I think, a little more safer also. Uh, like how we say, we, we know about a right and responsibilities as a citizen. Uh, similarly, students need to know their rights and responsibilities towards the digital device, to the, towards the social media also. So mm -hmm. if students are able to see this, because see, there's a lot of incorrect and uh, negative information out there. These mm -hmm. days, watching the news is also not something which is going to help you because it's going to like literally take over you. Uh, it's mm -hmm. so much of negativity. Plus, there are a lot of people out there with wrong intentions also. So uh, if we as parents or we as adults are able to help them, plus monitor them about what they see. We also as parents and adults need to monitor what they are looking into, what they are researching into, what they are hearing. Is there some news which they are continuously, you know, trying to uh, take a whole, uh, you know, trying to understand what this news is about or whom are they meeting also? I would like to uh, share uh, recently, I've dealt with a 14-year-old girl from mm -hmm. the city itself, mm -hmm. from a very much middle, upper class uh, segment. Mm -hmm. And she started, so 14 means ninth grade over here. And uh, she started using Instagram without her parents' uh, understanding from grade 7. Mm -hmm. Okay, so somehow or the other, she used to get a hang of the phone and she started off. She started talking to random boys. Just random ones, no connections at all. Now, the recent uh, thing is that she got into a relationship with an 18 year old boy uh, who's nowhere connected to anybody, and uh, he stays in a remote village, who's dropped out of education and school, has no work. And uh, when I was speaking to this child, the child said, I have taken care of everything. I am sure that this boy is good and he is correct. Reason being, I did a video call with this boy, you know. I saw his house, I saw his parents, I saw him. So he's not cheating. So as a child, she just thought by doing this kind of a thing is going to safeguard her 
uh, is so difficult for the parent and that's when the parent got her because she started talking about marriage and all at the age of 14 she stopped about settling with this guy rather than you know uh, focusing on her hobbies and education so this is what it does to a child you know social media is very very uh, cruel in its own way so as parents we need to see what children are doing and uh, it is not interference till an extent if you are going to communicate with your child correctly rather than checking his or her phone you know uh, you know behind her back then i'm sure it's not interference in your child's life so yeah mm-hmm. if uh, somebody does go through a bad experience and they realize that you know they are being cyber bullied or um, they are um, not they are they are being forced to misuse the social media what do you advise the first thing like where do you advise them to go what is the first thing they should do Uh, uh Tiffany do you, would you like yeah, to answer that sure. I mean I think it is really difficult I think as as educators we have to be very very aware of what's going on um so if a child starts presenting in a in a slightly different manner if they start looking a bit uncomfortable or or just a bit different at school they seem down or 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 whatever we need to check in with them we would anyway from a safeguarding perspective but just to make sure that you know there isn't anyone asking them to do anything they're uncomfortable with online no one's trying to kind of groom them into doing anything they don't want to yes. do uh no one's bullying them there are such a range of things that that can be going wrong online for them um and i do think that probably is much more common than like the i suppose the old fashioned bullying of like you know the school kids in the playground with someone being someone up i think the majority of that of that we will find online these days um so yeah i think educators need to be on the lookout um i think as as kinjal said parents need to have this as much as an open dialogue as they can with their children i know it's difficult especially when they're teenagers and they don't want to talk to you um but i think if you try at home and nurture that kind of open and honest approach um it is really useful and i think that you know parents as i think i think kinjal said earlier need to be one step ahead of their kids there are so many apps you can get on phones now that will hide for instance hide your instagram or hide your snapchat yes. um, and i think it it's really important that parents are wise to that because you know as as kinjal's story presented kids think they know everything i thought i knew everything when i was 14 i yes. definitely didn't <laughs> um and and they can become quite you know i rate when you tell them that no actually you don't and you do need to be careful because it might well be that you know this man is is inappropriate or it might well be that you're actually talking to a 65 year old strange yes. person in russia or somewhere like you you just don't know on the internet so you just you know need to safeguard yourself and and have the support from your parents and your teachers to to help you I suppose learn the tools to do that. Absolutely. Um on that note we've been receiving quite a few interesting questions yeah. from the audience. They seem to be engaging a lot. Thank you so much for uh, sharing these questions with us. Uh do you think we could answer some of them? Of course. Sure, why not? Um so the first question to Tiffany is uh how do you get students to be open about cyber stalking? I think you know as I said it is really really difficult but I think you know cultivating a culture of openness letting them know that they will not be in trouble for coming to you with a problem because I think sometimes you know say if a child is is being groomed by someone older they might think oh no I've done something really stupid I've sent them some photos that I shouldn't have I'm going to get in loads of trouble I think you know all we can do is advise them like you know preemptively like don't do these things but if they do do them we will make mistakes that you know we will help you through this we will you know look at everything that's gone on you know if we need to get any any legal things involved um we will do that um and and that they can feel really really comfortable um coming to us and making sure that you know we are able to help them that they're safe in the knowledge that we will be there to help them absolutely Um Kinjal um a question for you is how do you teach responsibility of dis- digital usage to children uh i think firstly what i said was be a good role model it is very important if your children will exactly do what you are doing that's the key to everything uh plus 
sit and talk to the child that as per the age what are a few do's and what are a few don'ts for them obviously you can't compare uh, the child cannot compare that mama you are doing this so i'll be doing this there's there's a lot of age difference there which we need to consider also but at the same time you as a family if you sit down that this is what a few things you can do and these are a few things you cannot do even if your friends are doing it that's their family matter that's their values and their ethics and whatever you know their family has decided but not something what we would be doing so again coming back to the same thing about opening up and speaking first i think when you give a device it is very important to speak if you want to do a preventive measure you will have to speak to your child otherwise we'll go back to the corrective measures when something has happened then then we'll have to you know rectify it absolutely and and i think that's you know where we end up with kids who who won't talk because they're like oh yes. you're going to get punished um yes. so i i completely agree in those preventative measures yes kinjal would there be a specific age um you recommend a child can work independently on a gadget by that's one of the questions we've received um uh, honestly if personally you ask me i think till the age of 15 that is approximately when the child passes his 10th standard should not be getting an independent phone again if it's for safety if he's going for some classes or if he's going far away then you need to give a device but i'm sure you can give a very simple uh, device which does not have you know other uh, you know apps and all which the child could be going wrong with uh, again it's very uh, personal based you know some children are responsible by their own self and some students are not like like every human is different uh, probably i was uh, a responsible child and my brother wasn't one he was the naughty side so probably my parents would trust me more and probably give me a gadget before him probably uh, we did not get it then but still if i go to compare this way every child is different so understand your child understand if he is able to and it's it's children so they are going to make mistakes we will have to give that benefit of doubt that my child can go wrong it's very important uh, most of the times i see that parents think my child cannot do anything wrong i say excuse me i'm sorry Uh, every <laughs> child is going to make a mistake and that's how he's going to grow and learn so having that benefit of down understand your child and then decide to give a uh, device completely or not um thank you for that um tiffany uh, since uh, one of the questions asks in uh, in addition to parents teaching their kids what about teachers how can teachers be open to educating children in classrooms absolutely i think that you know i think that needs to be as i said before built into the curriculum so there needs to yes. be whether that's through tutor time or whether that is through um we here at whopping have uh, what we call aspire days so we have full days dedicated to different elements of a child's pastoral education um and one of one of those days is built around you know internet usage cyberbullying etc so i think you know schools need to take an active step in building this learning for young people into their you know yearly curriculum because otherwise you know if it's just sort of like oh yeah they might do a bit of that in IT or oh they might do a bit of that in you know wherever they're not going to get the quality of learning that they need in order to to really understand you know how to use devices how to be safe on devices how to interact and communicate on devices and how to use them appropriately for learning as well absolutely um the other question that is very interesting uh, has to do with ads and something that bothers all of us about yes. how there are like um not very relevant ads that pop up and um what what should we do when that happens for children like misleading ads that um often poison the minds of children how do we yes. teach them to ignore those and um how 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 do we teach them what to click on and what not to click on on the digital device on the internet um kinjal would you like to answer that oh so i think when we start introducing a device to a child made be in whichever grade i think it's for a few days as i told you that we need to educate the child that goes without saying we need to talk to them and to talk to them we have to be smarter that's for sure we have to be one step ahead Uh, it cannot be that the child is teaching you at the end of the day you will have to otherwise the ball is in the child's court he's smarter than you and as 
uh, Tiffany said there are apps to hide Insta and Snapchat and it's smarter. So we need to be a little more smarter over there. <laughs> so when we are introducing a device, this is one of the things which we talk about. One is the security settings of your phone or of any apps you're using or social media you're using. Every now and then you need to uh, check on your security settings. Uh, and a few days when you're introducing the phone, let the child use it in front of you. Uh, it becomes you know, very casually. It's not supposed to be, oh, you sit next to me and then only. No, it can be that whenever you're using the phone, just be around me. So you can keep on peeping in what's happening. And obviously, you're going to educate the child about that these are the few things which will happen. Some random request you might get or there would be some screens, uh, you know, which will pop up and... It could be irrelevant stuff uh, for your age. And if you're confused about it, first thing, just ask me or ask your father or ask your auntie, uncle, anybody who's an adult and not your friend, obviously. Uh, and uh, then you can take a decision if you want to you know, get over there. It could be a spam also. These days you get so many uh, spam messages on phone, on through messages, emails, WhatsApp, and uh, you know, different ways. So this is how you can introduce this to the child. And I feel this is going to come up. So it's better if you inform them beforehand. Maybe true. True. That's a very, very good point. It, it's talking about that, the idea of what might happen. It's that preemptive approach again. Because yes. um, then they won't think, oh, maybe I've done something wrong on the social media for it to have oh. got this advert for me. Oh, no. Um, instead, they might be then be like, mum, uh, I'm not sure what this is. What do I do? So that, that sounds sensible. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. um, the, other, uh, the other question that the audience is asking is, um, do you think it makes sense to speak to 10 and 11 year olds about stalking? Do you think they understand? That's for you, Tiffany. Um, yeah, I, do, I think it's really important to speak to, if the, child, if the 10 or 11 year old has a device, so for instance, if they have Instagram, that one seems to have popped up a lot, they might have people trying to follow them, for example, um, and then maybe start to like a lot of their pictures and then start to ask them for information on direct message. Like that can happen so, so easily if the child, for instance, doesn't have high privacy settings, they don't have their account set to private. Um, so I think it's really important that children are aware, you know, I don't suppose you have to go into like horrific detail, but that children are aware that there might be some people out there who have, you know, poor intentions towards them and that they just need to be aware um, and they need to not be, you know, allowing um, random people on the internet to follow them, for example. Um, and, you know, they need to be aware that it's out there because it can happen to anyone. You do hear stories of, you know, 10 or 11 year olds being groomed by untowards older people. So if they don't know that it exists, they're not going to know how to manage it or they're not going to know that they need to speak up about it if something does happen. Absolutely. I think I grew up at an age when I was um, 18 and I got the digital devices started coming up when I was 18. So I was at more or less a safer age and everybody was trying to, you know, uh, understand it, adults and children likewise. But now when kids are, the new kids, the kids that are being like, um, um, they, they're receiving the gadgets for the first time, they're like five years old. So it yes. is very necessary. This conversation was most insightful. And um, like I said, with uh, as many um, articles and videos there are on personal hygiene, there should be just as many on like digital hygiene because we spend most of our days, almost eight hours, um, adults spend almost eight hours working on their laptops. So thank you so, so much for this conversation. Um, it was most insightful for me as well. And I encourage anyone who is ever lost and whoever needs um, help in regard to digital hygiene should definitely look it up on their digital devices because that's a good way of using it to, you know, better yes. your, um, better your um, horizon of knowledge and just uh, learn so much more about how to do things correctly. Um, thank you audience for being here and listening to us. I hope that was helpful and I hope you all um, can maintain digital hygiene now henceforth. And yes, thank you for streaming in. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you Aradhita. Thank, thank you, thank you the audience. Thank you. of the audience. I think, uh, can I, can I, oh, there's a, okay. So uh, just uh, ending note to this that uh, 
uh, it's a dual challenge for parents it's it's a dual challenge for everybody that how to mitigate the harms uh, of digital world in comparison to how much maximize we can uh, benefit from the device so as adults as children if you are able to balance this up uh, just to see that the harm is uh, you know as much less as possible and the benefits are you know over there for us then i think we'll be able to uh, deal with our children or our own selves better and i think somewhere we need to accept that this is the world it is Absolutely. the you know when parents say oh during our times we did not have okay fine but unfortunately or fortunately this is what it is and we need to accept it because we have also been on the digital device for the longest time ever now so it's better that this is what it is so what can be best done out of it and i think that this end note i would like to say communication is the key communication of parents teachers very as the research, recent recent uh, studies which i read was approximately when a teenager or a child gets into trouble on social media there's approximately uh, 54% will approach their friends as compared to only 40 approx percent will go to uh, uh will go to uh, their friend uh, go to the parents and only approximately 20 to 25% will go to the teachers so i think as parents and teachers we need to raise our bar so that you know uh, firstly uh, children approach us and we can help them and not blame them if children feel we are blaming them uh, and we are going to like uh, reprimand them very severely then uh, they will stop coming to us absolutely i i couldn't agree more i think you've really hit the nail on the head with pretty much everything i was going to say there striking that balance ensuring that open and honest conversation yes. has the, the capacity to take place and that education um of of the children around digital hygiene takes place on a regular yes. basis and not just you know once when they're 11 this is digital hygiene it needs to be consistent it needs to be maintained yes. um, like like any hygiene um so i think that is incredibly important and i'm really yes. i've really enjoyed this this sort of chat show and yes. yes. thank you very much kinja thank you thank you. thank you thank you thank you so, you so much, much. Time. thank you audience thank you aradita for asking the right questions i would say <laughs> thank you thank you kinja thank you tiffany mm-hmm.